Oh man, I probably just flashed a nip. <laughs> it's your lucky day. <laughs> I would die, but I would live on it. <laughs> and you can see the paper mache bodies around his apartment, but the police do not know there are real bodies in there. I want something sexy. That's L-I-Q-U-O-R. Don't get it twisted. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Kitty Liquor. That's L-I-Q-U-O-R. Don't get it twisted. This is episode 151, and I'm your host, Cat Wonders. I mean, Devil Wonders. I, okay, a couple things. I have different lighting because I want you to be able to see that I'm burning candles. <laughs> It was too bright to even see that there were candles. I have a fly problem right now, but that is actually appropriate being that this is the first Halloween podcast of the month. So it just adds another little creepy factor. And uh, <laughs> I feel like I should order some fake flies from Amazon just to like throw into my cocktails for this month, but too little too late. I thought of it too late. <laughs> okay, so I am very devilish. I'm actually quite enjoying this costume. It is comfortable, but there are little parts of these flames that kind of like are itchy and pokey. So if I start to kind of like move things around, that's why. <laughs> um, my nipples are right here. So I just have to be careful with my leans, my laughs, my mm, sneezes. So yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna make a cocktail. And being that I'm the devil, I'm going to be making a, a spicy cocktail with some um, cinnamon liqueur. Now, I keep, I don't know what this is. <laughs> I'm playing a character, I think, and I'm just, it's just coming out. Um, I tried to find some red gloves and I found some, but they're like a really hot velvet glove. And I'm already boiling up here because I left my heat on last night. <laughs> Actually, it's been on for a couple days now, but which is fine. It just means it's over 20 degrees in here. And we're just going to roll with it. It's kind of like filming in the summertime. <laughs> It makes sense that it's an inferno in here, doesn't it? I'm the devil. Um, and now that all the lights are off everywhere else in my studio, all the flies are coming this direction because of the bright lights on this end. So we're just going to roll with the punches and give her. <laughs> so it's funny. I found this bottle in my pantry and I've had it for a while. I didn't realize that it was called Sinferno. And when I was like, oh, Inferno, of course, like cinnamon, perfect. And I was like, what if the cocktail name was Sinferno? I'm like, how appropriate. And I, then I realized this is Sinferno. Somebody already beat me to that punch too. <laughs> but this is super good. It's kind of like Fireball, but it's not as sweet. And um, which I appreciate because Fireball is like pure sugar syrup. And then I've just got some cranberry juice and we are going to also add potentially some of this beautiful Italian, I guess like they're kind of like um, maraschino cherries, but they're Amarina wild cherries in syrup from Italy. And when I was in Italy, I saw these in the grocery store for like a tenth of the price, <laughs> but they're so heavy, like they're glass jars. But there's no way that I'd be able to bring them home anyway, especially because I did carry on. So I really didn't get to bring too much home in the way of food, which is a shame when you're coming home from Italy. This thing is so sticky everywhere I touch it. I just wind up getting sticky. And I have tactile intolerance, tactile intolerance. And so if I have anything on my hands, I need to get it off. Like I will wash my hands in a dirty puddle on the side of the road just to get like any stickiness off. Also, do you guys like my earrings? <laughs> I just thought that this would be appropriate. I mean, the devil smokes. So if, the, if this lit up right now, 
then that would be perfect. But <laughs> I just thought that was a funny, appropriate accessory for this costume. <laughs> and then I've got my glass. And I've got my shaker and my... Shaker. And then I've got this long ass spoon to try to dig cherries out. Now, I think these are expired, but I don't know for sure because these are like, if you have a jar of maraschino cherries in your fridge, 12 years later, you can pretty much open it up. It might be crystallized a little bit, but I don't think it goes bad. However, I do know that the cherries in here froze because if you put anything at the very back of my refrigerator, it freezes into solid ice, <laughs> except for the pickles, because I think there's so much salt in the brine that it can't freeze. It's kind of like the ocean water, but we're going to try it anyway. The cherries look suspicious. They look like they've been frozen, but they don't look rotten. They look a little bit like there's been like crystallized something forming on them. See, like crystallized sugar. But I think it's just frozen and sugary. Should I just eat it? It's just crystallized sugar. Look, some of them are like totally. Mm. Oh. That I could live on that. I would die, but I would live on it. <laughs> you guys that fly, did you see that hit my face? That almost flew into my mouth. <laughs> I was laughing like, ha ha ha. Anyway, let's make a cocktail. And we're just gonna wing it as we normally do. I'm going to be using two ounces of this Sinferno. Um, it is 40%. So you do have to be a little careful with it. I'm going to put some ice in. And the rest of the ice are going to be in my glass. So this is fairly straightforward and simple. And I'm going to accessorize with a dry piece of lemon. Um, so two ounces of the Sinferno. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna try a little sip. So it's got more of like, for fuck's sake. That wasn't good. This shit's really, really sweet. Not as sweet as I said, fat fireball. Vodka, honey, and cinnamon. Those are the three ingredients. Okay, two shots of that. I'm just going to figure out how I'm gonna deal with my left hand covered in syrup. Oh man, I probably just flashed a nip. <laughs> it's your lucky day. <laughs> um, okay. Under the nails. It's gonna be okay. I wonder if I could just burn the sugar off. It's fine. It's not too bad. Okay, so now we're gonna add our cranberry juice. I've never mixed these two flavors together, so I don't know how this is gonna turn out. Not that much. And then I'm gonna not add any of the cherry juice. I'm just gonna get the disgusting looking cherries out and put them in to finish off our cocktail. So let's shake, shake, shake this up. Just Sinferno and cranberry juice. Getting better at that. Damn. 
Oh yeah, no, I have one. Ha <laughs> ha! I was gonna say I don't have my little sieve. Oh, I was confident I just, I had the exact right amount, but I have a little extra, a little bonus. I gotta, I should probably put the cherries in now because I feel like a fly is literally gonna go in there and ruin everything. One cherry, two cherries. I don't know why it's so fizzy. Nothing's carbonated. Oh my god. <laughs> my left hand is so sticky. And also, let's add a little slice of lemon, shall we? Oh. Very sick. Let's try, I'm still gonna call it a Sinferno because I actually thought of it before I realized the, <laughs> the spicy, look, what is it even? Is it, it's not a whiskey, it's a vodka honey cinnamon beverage. Um, I thought of it first, okay? <laughs> okay, here we go. That is lovely. That is very, very, very nice. Cranberry juice and cinnamon. So this would work also with Fireball. It'd be sweeter. And I think Fireball might have a bit of a better flavor all around. This is a little bit harsh. It's not as smooth as Fireball, but I guess there's less sugar. So maybe I'm just tasting more of the vodka, but you could definitely do this with, oh, Jimothy. Sorry, buddy. Jimothy's my right hand man. As you can see why I like him for his right hand. <laughs> no, come on, you can do it. He's just gonna have to hang out back there. <laughs> so, as I'm sipping my cocktail, we're gonna have some discussions. Um, this is gonna maybe turn some of you off, majorly, but Ever since I was born, I've had, I have freckles and moles. I've had a couple removed. I actually had one removed when I was quite young just because it looked suspicious and who knows, maybe the doctor was just like, I can make an extra couple hundred bucks by cutting that thing off. So my mom was like, yeah, sure, go for it. And um, she never paid for it, but like, you know, how doctors work. So on the back of my neck, I've had two moles forever. Definitely nothing suspicious or weird about them. They're just moles that piss me off. Like if I'm wearing anything that like I need to pull over my neck, that's a bit tight. It's just, they're just annoying and I wanted to get rid of them. Now I looked into getting a dermatologist appointment and it's like six to eight months before I can get an appointment. And I'm like, I want to get rid of these puppies now. I'm not patient for that. What if I die next week? And I, I would hate to die with those moles. <laughs> I want to know what it's like to live my life without these moles that bother me in the back of my neck. So I went on Amazon <laughs> and I ordered me a skin tag removal kit for do for do two different sizes of skin tags. And I was like, I wonder if this would work for moles. And as I was reading the comments and the reviews, I should say, they there were people on there that were talking about how it removed their mole, like no problem, within a couple of days it fell off. Like, so what it is, it's a kit that allows you to expand a tiny, tiny little elastic band, a really strong one over your mole and it releases it on the mole and basically chokes it off so that it gets no more blood supply and it will eventually fall off. And it said it could take anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. Now, I just so happen to not have any real serious events coming up where I would want to make sure that I had everything just ready to go and not weird strange elastics on the back of my neck if I wore my hair up or something. And it's also October. 
So that means that it's spooky season and now is the time to do it, <laughs> to do something disgusting and freaky. So I ordered the kit and applied, actually had a friend do it because I could not see what the hell I was doing. And um, I have two tiny little elastic bands around both of my moles in the back of my neck. Now, this is a skin take kit. So I was a little bit worried about doing this, but I was reading comments and reviews from people saying that they did it. So we're just going to see what happens. This morning though, I was making my coffee and I was feeling one and it, I was like, wow, it's already feeling like really hard and dry. Like it's ready just to go. And then I moved like it around in kind of like a circle just gently, but, and the elastic came off. And I thought, I was like, oh my God, my mole already fell off. No, it was the elastic. <laughs> so anyway, elastic has been reapplied and uh, I just know not to play around with it, but I'm a little bit of a picker. So I kind of like, I know it's there. They ache a little bit. They're not, it's not like the most comfortable thing, but it's not that uncomfortable. If the result is me having these gone and I did it on my own without being brutal and just slicing them off, then I'll be happy. That's all I have to say. <laughs> also, I have not worn red lipstick in a hot minute and I really love it. <laughs> Actually, I found a method on how to wear red lipstick the most comfortable and efficient way. Usually, if I'm wearing red lipstick and it's not for filming, it's to go out for a nice dinner. However, when you're out for a nice dinner, you're on a date or you're with friends, you're eating food, you are potentially having lipstick on your teeth and maybe your friends don't tell you. The best, I found the best two products that don't smudge, don't fade and also come off easily. Because I can't tell you how many times I have worn red lipstick and it completely ruins my lips because the amount of scrubbing I have to do, oh, I just got a message and it just came on my laptop randomly. Um, but if, oh yes, I was saying, um, it screwed up the pH of my lips because I had to scrub this red off because the liner that I used was like a waterproof liner. And essentially the lipstick came off fine, but the lip liner stayed on almost like a freaking tattoo. So I had to scrub and scrub and scrub my lips man. And then I had like chap lips for three weeks after that. Cause I just, I removed like the protective layer, on, like my natural skin barrier was just destroyed. <laughs> so I found that same lip liner. I was going to use it today. And then I remembered, I was like, no, this is a bad one. So I'm just using something that's like as good, maybe not as long lasting, but it's, uh, the combo is good. And the key is to powder your lipstick as you're adding layers and to set the lips down. I'm, I'm not doing a gloss. I'm doing, mine's like a pretty matte red lip, which to me tends to work the best because you still get the effect of a red lip, but it's not coming off and everything. Like it'll come off if I kiss my hand. I'm not using anything super long lasting. Like I said, I don't want to because I can't disturb the balance. But anyway, so that's what's going on. <laughs> but I'm like, I should wear red lips more often. And every time I have worn a red lip out, people are like, I love your lipstick. Thank you. <laughs> so I guess it's not as common to go out with a bright red lip these days, but I was, I was watching this, um, it was an Instagram reel or something and it was old Hollywood, sort of like old money, old Hollywood glam. And these men and women would dress up as if they were going to like an old movie in the 40s and the girls had their hair done so beautifully it just looked they looked like they just walked off a movie set but this one girl was wearing this beautiful suit a hat she had short brown hair but it was all done really and her face is just beautiful red lip just walking I think through some square in Italy or something and the amount of attention she drew just from what she was wearing and I mean of course she was curvy and beautiful as well but it was the wildest thing to watch people's reactions to her just walking through the square. And it was like, you know, coffee shops and little whatever. It was just, just because of how she looked. And it was such a throwback, but it was so classy and beautiful. And I love that era. And I've always been obsessed with like pinup girls and, and Vargas girls and 
I did my own pinup calendar a few years ago. It didn't really turn out exactly the way that I wanted it to. It was a bit more moody, moody pinup. I wanted like bubblegum pinup, like bright colors, like very exaggerated, very like, you know, um, but the photographer that I chose was not, she's more of a boudoir photographer. So it was quite, like I said, it was beautiful, but moody. And then the girl that did my makeup, who supposedly knew what she was doing, really did not know what she was doing. So the photographer had to do my hair and makeup because this girl was screwing everything up. And <laughs> anyway, it was kind of a nightmare, but it worked out fine. I got my photos, um, did the calendar. It was good. But uh, anyway, I do want to do it again. But this time I'll like fly to California to like a studio that is very or even just do it in Palm Springs. Palm Springs is like the ultimate backdrop for anything like pinup in my mind anyway so yeah enough about that and my red lip and I've got four episodes to film this month and each episode I will be something different and this year I'm going for quite classic costumes and what classic costumes means is sort of like you're gonna see me in if you could think of the top four costumes, like sexy costumes for women, that's going to be what it is. <laughs> In the past, I've been a little bit more creative, I think, but this is just more, maybe more pinup. Maybe each one is a little bit more pinup, but I'm playing a character in, in each. And um, what can I say? We're just going to have some fun. <laughs> um, okay, so... I watch the viral podcast with Chelsea Lynn and Paige Jin. It is the one of the trashiest podcasts ever, but I love it. And how much lipstick do I have on my teeth? None. Woo! Um, it's just really interesting to listen to, and they're just super real, and they talk about the raunchiest stuff. Like, I mean, if you... Sorry about this. Oh, my God. I'm wearing false lashes I haven't worn for a very long time, and, like, one is poking into the corner of my eyeball. <laughs> You're going to see me scratch. You're going to see me scratch my eye a few times. Um, anyway, but they have a segment on their podcast where they they call it Love Hate. And I really like that segment because it's very relatable. And I mean, sometimes not because there's three or four of them at a time in the studio. And so they each go through their love and then they each go through their hate. And it's just basically stuff that you love or stuff that you hate. It's just quite simple. But I was thinking about one and I thought, oh, for this month, for my Halloween podcast I want to do a love hate for each episode and the love that I'm going to bring up is and this is kind of like a general thing I love autumn cooking I love when the weather shifts and it's not so hot in the day and it's colder at night and I bust out my candles I recently switched, by the way, all of my candles from Bath and Body Works, which I found out are super toxic, to all natural soy toxin-free candles. And I find that they last so much longer. And I'm going to go off on just like a little candle tangent, but I'll get back to the cooking part after my tangent. <laughs> um, but... Like burning a candle, like in the summertime and it's an inferno, it's hot. It's like hot in the day. And by the time it cools down at night, it's like a relief. I don't really think about burning candles, but it's getting darker earlier. It's cooling down. The candles are lit probably by five o'clock. I'm usually starting to cook dinner around 4, 35 o'clock. Light up the candles. And it's just, there's just something about that. But that day, I'm so prepared in the morning for what I'm going to cook in the afternoon and not every day. Every day, is, every day is different where I'm more busy or less busy or whatever. But um, recently acquired a lot of moose meat. I helped butcher the thing and I've done this before. Um, but now I've got like a freezer full of moose meat and I've been going crazy with cooking roasts. Um, last night I did a spaghetti with the burger. Um, I'm just like loving every minute of it and uh also when you have a freezer full of meat it's a lot easier to plan for your meals so that's sort of what am I gonna eat tonight leftover spaghetti <laughs>
So that's a love of mine. What I hate, and this very recently was happening to me almost on a daily basis, <laughs> is when you get sand in your sunscreen. <laughs> so I was in Sardinia. And on the West Coast, it's a lot windier than on the East Coast. So Sardinia is an Italian island off the coast of the mainland. So it's it's to the West. Yes, the West of Italy, but it still is Italy. And on the West Coast, it is very, I should say very windy. It depends on the day. Um, but when you are trying to apply sunscreen, which I didn't actually very often, but at the beginning I did, um, I was mixing the sand in because it was blowing all around. And I'll tell you what, sandy sunscreen is just sick. And the sunscreen that we had was very oily. And the sand would just like, that is just, I hate when I have sunscreen and sand mixed together and I'm rubbing it on my skin and it's rough and it's scra scraping and scratchy. And that's a hate of mine. So that's my love and that's my hate. And that concludes love hate. <laughs> oh my goodness. I noticed that when I'm smiling really big, this is when this lash just wants to wreak havoc. Can you see the edge of my paper? <laughs> okay, horror stories. So I recently was recommended um, a YouTuber that tells horrific stories horrific true stories, um, or allegedly true stories. And, um, I really enjoy the channel. However, the guy that's the host drives me a little bit crazy, but it's not because he's like over animated or anything. It's just, there's a lack of, um, reaction. And what's the name? It's, he's something horrors. I probably should know because I'm telling you the story, but um, his channel is all him telling stories. And a lot of times the video that he does is like three horror stories you've never heard or the most horrific, um, disappearance stories of the century or something. And so he goes through these stories and he, in the video, it's interesting to watch because he will pull up like videos, video clips. He will kind of like take you along and share, but Bailey Sarian is one that does this and I, I'm not sure if she does it full time or I haven't seen a video of hers for a long time, but she just heard like a random voice, female voice. Anyway, so she um, will tell the story of whatever story she's telling. It's usually a horror story and like a horrific something, but she'll kind of like have little reactions to it. Like she'd be like, yeah, that's crazy or something, you know, where this guy that's telling these stories and it's this whole channel. I think he's got almost like 10 million subscribers. He's like successful. So like, this is just my opinion. It's not, he has already made it. So that's no issue. But um, he, he just like, he's just telling the story. Like he's reading a script and not giving any like reaction to what he's reading. So I wish there was a little bit more of that, but at least you're getting the facts. You're hearing the story and then they're showing you things. And, and I kind of like it, but um Recently, I was going through some of them and none of them really grasped me, but it was my own fault because I could watch another 10 videos and probably find a really creepy story in there. But I really like there are certain aspects of a story that creep me out, like a strange detail or something that's so like something you've never heard of before. That's just like, excuse me. So I have a friend who last winter was driving home and on the way home, she saw a woman in the middle of the road with long black scraggly hair. She looked like kind of like she was on crack or meth or something like a meth head that's very skinny and gaunt. She had a shiny object in one hand and something else in her other hand and was running towards the car, my friend's car. And so my friend was like, what the frick? But because she had like a weapon, my friend decided to back out of the way. And so, like, obviously they're not gonna hit her, but like she's threatening you. So my, I was like, you should have just smoked her. 
And she said as she got closer to this woman that was in the street with this, with this weapon, she had like children's snow pans in her other hand and was like, like that story still gives me chills. What, like it would have been a story with just like the weapon and the whatever children's snow pants, like little snow pants in the other hand. Anyway, she backs up, winds up smoking a, a freaking snowbank. She damages her car. Luckily, the woman that was after her or whatever was not determined to kill her or something because she got stuck in the ditch. And so the whole time she's stuck in the ditch, she's thinking, she's trying to back out. She's thinking this woman's coming with the freaking <laughs> knife and the snow pants. <laughs> but apparently she just disappeared and went away and never, like there was no, never anything Police were called. Police showed up. I think they figured out like that was like a crackhead living nearby. Um, anyway, wild. So that is kind of like that little twist in that story is what freaks me out. And because, you know, there's dozens of stories and well, probably millions of stories of people being approached with a crazy person with a weapon. But the children's snow pants, what the frick does that mean? That's crazy. So I was going to go over like some of before, like, so the next episodes, I'd like to have some new stories that I haven't told that I haven't heard. I'd like to read it with you live, like where I'm reading it for the first time too, and give my reaction as I'm reading the story. That's how I kind of want to watch people read stories or like see their reaction and see if I, mine matches theirs. Like, so I think similarly, you'd like to see the same thing. So I'm going to go and try to find a website where I can find some stories that I haven't read before or heard before that are going to be decently scary, <laughs> but true. I like true crime, true horrors, maybe unexplained, but things that have actually happened. So the first story that I can think of, which I've told the story before and gone into some detail and like read the story about in Russia... <laughs> you guys are like oh this story again but some of you have not heard this story excuse me in russia there is a story of a guy this is a, not a story this is a true this is a fact so what, what do you call it's not a story it's a true rendition it's it's a story i'm telling you a story but the story is true it's a true story in russia there was a man that was digging up freshly buried bodies in his local graveyard. And there were these bodies that were going missing. So I'm not sure if, to be honest, if, he, if people knew that the bodies were going missing, but he would see a mound of fresh dirt. He would go and dig the body up and probably just cover his tracks and bury the body or bury, not sorry, bury the body, but make it look like it did before. So people don't even maybe know that the body's missing. Because I think this happened for a while. This happened for a while before anybody caught him or figured out what was going on. So he would dig up these bodies, but only bodies apparently of young children, young girls specifically. So what he was doing was he was taking these bodies back to his apartment. I don't know in, in what in a bag, in a suitcase, in a something, not sure, taking his bod these bodies back to his apartment. And like, think about the complexity of this task and to get away with it for so long, where you have to be in a graveyard. And typically they're not just pitch black. Maybe they are. But if the ones I've been to at night, there's like a light here, a light there, you're going to be seen at some point. You got to go. You got to dig, dig the body up. Like this is not, I'm not sure if he has equipment. Maybe he's working at the graveyard. Is he, does he have a backhoe or is he just laboring and digging up these bodies? Oh my God. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was an hour past where I was supposed to be finished. <laughs> anyway, so not only that, then you have to take that body and you have to get it home. Okay, fine. Put it in your car. Nothing suspicious. Pull up to your apartment. You're in an apartment. Other people live where you live. <laughs> He's got to get the body out of his car into his apartment. 
Somehow he got away with this multiple times, 13 or 16 or something times. When he would get the body back to his apartment, that's when he would do his thing. And let me just explain what his thing was. He would essentially embalm the body. So the body, I think, is already drained. Apparently, he would pump it full of fluid to preserve it. And then he started wrapping. He would cover the bodies with almost like a paper mache type material. But before he would wrap them up, in the chest cavity of the body, he would put a music box in the chest cavity, close up the chest cavity. And later on in an interview as to what he, why he would do that, he said that he wanted to them to be happy and to live they he just basically wanted them to to give them life again so what i don't know is would he turn the music on and then start you know was it just the music box why how did he get the cavity like did he brutally like open them up and put it in or is there a cavity there anyway when they do the autopsy All I know is I have a thousand questions and he embalmed the bodies, wrapped them up in like a paper mache and would paint faces on the paper mache and get this, there was some suspicious, some suspicion happening. So somebody, like I said before, might've seen him leave the graveyard, might've seen him carrying something, might've seen him covered in dirt up to here and going into his apartment. Something was not, something was not right. And somebody noticed and they called the police. The police show up at this guy's apartment. Okay. The inside of his apartment looks kind of like a hoarder apartment. There's piles of things. There's papers, there's, uh, and but they notice there's these life size paper mache dolls around. Get this. There's video of this on YouTube. The story is quite popular. Um, I'll link the video down below. And I'm, I know the guy's name. All, all you have to type in Google is um, music box in chest, Russia. <laughs> Something like that. You'll find the story. Anyway, so there is body cam footage from the police walking through his apartment and you can see the paper mache bodies around his apartment, but the police do not know there are real bodies in there, right? So the police are going through his apartment. They're looking at stuff. It's weird. It stinks. Maybe, I don't know. They notice it's kind of strange, but they can't find anything to arrest the guy. So they leave. Whatever else triggered them to go back, he wound up getting caught. And I think that there was something like 16 bodies in his apartment that were just decaying away underneath the paper mache. (laughs) Where's Dr. Seuss? (laughs) Who needs him when you got me? Could you imagine my, imagine that children's story? Oh my God. Anyway, so that's one story. I'm sure I left out lots of like crucial details and maybe mix them up. So you do your own research about that situation but that is a real story and you should check it out second story that creeps me out probably like these are my top three I probably have more but second one is where (laughs) there was like a shipping yard um I shouldn't say a shipping yard it's more like where their ships come in and they take containers off of ships and they use them for storage. Some, some containers get sold. You can rent them out for storage. You can whatever. So apparently somebody was short on their payment for their container rental. And when you don't make payment to keep your thing stored in the container, it works the same way kind of as a storage, you know, storage operation where you're keeping your stuff in storage, (laughs) but same thing with a container. You can rent a container monthly and keep your stuff stored. Apparently somebody stopped making payments and they had to go and take back the container. So whatever contents were inside, they'd have to remove it and then put the container back up for rent. Well, apparently they opened the container and it was full of fetuses. Babies. 
it was so full that it was like half full and it was all shapes and sizes from this size to this size, this size being like full term, um, horrific shit. And I mean, I can't even describe what the smell would be. I could not imagine, but there is interviews, live interviews of these employees that had found this horrific scene. And like some of them can't even talk about it. They can't, they couldn't conduct the interview because they were too emotional. Then there's other ones that go into detail about like what they saw and how crazy it was. And uh, that is such a creepy story that that, it just blows my mind. So there's that story. Then, and this is a totally different like twist. It's nothing to do with murder. It just is more of a close call story. And I believe it was Mark Normand, who's one of my favorite comedians. He was telling the story, and I don't know if it was on his podcast, because he's got a podcast with Sam Morrell called We Might Be Drunk. <laughs> we have a similar podcast. I, <laughs> Kitty Liquor. I make cocktails too. But they make a cocktail every episode as well. But Mark was talking about his childhood and when he has these memories of when he was a kid, and I think he'd get out, he'd leave his bedroom to go pee or he'd leave to go get a glass of water in the kitchen or something when he was little, little, like six, seven, eight. And when he would go to the kitchen or the bathroom, he would see what looked like a crouched down body, like person in the living room or in the corner of the kitchen or in the hallway, he'd see this, this like figure every time he would go to the bathroom or the kitchen for something to drink or to pee. <laughs> I'm such a good storyteller, you guys. Oh, anyway, let's make sure nothing's burning here. Maybe I'll move this. Anyway, so he would tell his parents about it. And his parents would be like, oh, you're just seeing things. Of course, he's little. He's not seeing anything in the apartment. He's not seeing people in there. Like, nothing's in there. But he was determined he would tell the story. Years later, he finds out that there was like a hatch in their pantry, I believe, allegedly, from what I remember, where this guy would come into their home or their apartment and take food take clothes. So he found this out years later. So his memory of this happening, his parents were like, holy shit, Mark was seeing this guy in our house. And every time Mark would go to the bathroom or the kitchen, whoever was in there would just hide in the corner and not move, thinking he's not being seen. <laughs> Could you imagine finding out all those years later? That it was actually a guy in there. It was actually a person that was breaking into their home. And your, your little kid is like going for milk. Could you imagine if Mark was like, hey, who are you? And then like, they could have killed the poor kid. I don't know. All I'm saying is that is creepy as hell. And that's what I'm talking about. Those three stories, that's kind of the, the realm of horror that I'm looking for. I want some really creepy shit, not just like, because I find if I'm looking online, it's super hard to find a story that's believable. Like I just read one where this guy um, was renting an old apartment and in the basement in the floor of this apartment, there was this storage locker that still had this desk inside and all the drawers were locked and obviously it belonged to somebody else in the apartment. And so um, he was trying to get his jacket fixed and he went down and uh, noticed that all the drawers were locked and he was some for some reason left his jacket down there by accident went down there all the drawers were suddenly unlocked there was a key on top of the desk and his jacket was miraculously fixed could have happened maybe that's something that did happen but I don't like those kind of stories I need like details and when I'm reading a story online I don't know how credible these are, but a lot of times the ones that I'm really interested in have like a new story attached, right? Like something that's that crazy and that horrific, there's going to be 
some sort of news article. Besides, like, if you hear a story, like I said, my friend with the knife and the children's snow pants. This was in the winter time, by the way. I might have forgot to mention that, but I, I kind of, okay. There's a fly in my drink. R.I.P. a little buddy. Alcohol kills everything. Actually, to be honest, if I, <laughs> I do have a friend that will not touch, like if a fly lands on her plate, she's like, I can't eat this. And I, I understand where she's coming from, but of all the times you've eaten something that a fly has landed on that you didn't see it land on, like your hot dog or something when you were a kid, you didn't die, did you? No. It's disgusting to have it immersed in liquid, but when there's alcohol in the liquid, I can't do coffee. If a fly's in my coffee, fuck it. The coffee's gone. I'll make another coffee. I'll buy another coffee. No, the cream, the fly, there's no alcohol to kill anything. No, but there's 80% in here. There's two shots of 40. <laughs> I think we're good. If I would have sucked it up through the straw, that would have been another story. But flies do gross me the fuck out. But when there are 75,000 in your studio, you just have to live with them. I still have to hang tape. <laughs> I need fly tape. <laughs> I could be really doing more about this problem, but I'm just being lazy about it. On the story train, while we're on this train of haunted horror stories, how many of you have seen online, whether it's on Instagram, TikTok, whatever, video clips of people squeezing through cave openings? They're literally inching through a crack this wide. And every time they exhale, they inch a little further. They're trying to get into the next cavern or whatever the hell, cave explorers, whatever you want to call them. Nothing evokes more anxiety and just internal horror than the idea of scooching through a crack in the earth to see what's beyond it. Like I am claustrophobic. I am not like an overly claustrophobic person. I'm not claustrophobic to an extreme, but if you roll me up in a carpet, I will die, okay? I have a story, a claustrophobia story that this tops every story I've ever heard about claustrophobia besides this whole cave exploration. When I was eight or nine years old, the neighbor kids were over and in the basement, we had a hide a bed. Well, we got this brilliant idea that we were going to try to roll up our friend into the hide a bed. Well, guess what? It worked. He lay down, we flipped the mattress over all three of us. And we freaking put him into the hide a bed thinking, ha ha ha, we got you little burrito. Well, he was screaming at the top of his lungs and suddenly the screaming stopped. It stopped dead. And we were like, oh, okay, shit. Well, because it was probably only like 10 seconds by the time he stopped screaming. I think he passed out. But imagine being a kid, and this kid was our age, maybe 10 years old. Imagine being in that hide bed squeezed in there so tight all you can do is scream you can't move a muscle well then guess what's next <laughs> um we weren't strong enough to pull the hide a bed back out so you've all taken a hide a bed out of a couch right pulled it out of a couch you know how sometimes you really got to use momentum you some of them are heavy and hard to get out well add 80 pounds to that you, we could not get him out. And he was dead silent. We were scared to tell the babysitter <laughs> that he was in there. So we waited probably another couple minutes and we tried to get him out. We tried to get him out because we were so afraid of getting in trouble for doing this. Finally, we went upstairs to get the babysitter and all four of us could barely get him out. We open up the hide-a-bed 
unfold it, and he is just drenched in sweat. I don't think he could even breathe in there. Think about how horrific that is. That claustrophobia story, and I still to this day worry that like karma, because the thing is, we didn't intend for that to happen. We intended to put fold him into the bed, but we didn't know as kids that that was going to happen. We didn't know he was going to get stuck in there. Almost killed the poor guy. And I'm sure he, I don't know if he blacked out because he is screaming, went from like horrific, frantic screaming to just dead silence. He just stopped screaming. And at that time, we didn't even think, oh, God, okay, we better get help. No, we just were scared that we were going to get in trouble. So we didn't get help. Anyway, long story short, we open up the hide bed He's drenched. And he's like, oh, shit, I think he passed out. His body went into, like, survival mode or something and started to, like, sweat. <laughs> and he was like, oh, shit, oh, man, that was scary. Like, But he was not delusional or anything he was just like whoa god that was that was horrific like that was terrible but he wasn't mad or he was just so happy to be out of that hide bed that I, I don't even know what what actually happened like how the four of us because it was like three little kids me my sister the other neighbor kid probably his brother and him he was like probably the biggest of all of us and man I'm just really thankful that that didn't go in another way imagine if there weren't what weren't parents around like what if it was just us at home and he was still in there like i wonder because i know a lot of kids have perished because of waterbeds because they wind up working their way somehow next to it and they don't have the strength to get themselves out so they that's why i think waterbeds are banned now because there's too many people that died because of them but a hide a bed so, I mean, it takes a lot more effort, I think. It would take somebody doing it to somebody else. Like, you can't really, you could close yourself into a hide -a bed, but you got to be pretty athletic. <laughs> Whereas a water bed, you can slip sideways. Maybe there's an earthquake and the whole bed goes this way and you just wind up flipping underneath it. And then you're, you know, I don't know. All I know is that type of scenario, like death by suffocation or death by claustrophobic, like, this sort of thing no that to be honest some people are like would you rather freeze to death or burn to death i'm like i would choose freezing or burning to death over asphyxiation and like just being stuck in a position but back to what i was talking about with these videos of these people that are like they have a gopro or something and they're recording themselves by themselves they're not even with other people a lot of times they're by themselves and they're like <sighs> I got one more foot to go, but then they're, they're heading a bit downhill and then their upper body starts to fill with blood because they're inverted a little bit. And then suddenly they can't get back out because their body has like expanded because there's more blood in their upper body now than their lower body. And like people like the stories that you can find, Oh my God. Like, I'm like sweating and I know. <laughs> anyway, no new little friends, my drink. Thank God. Sugar. I thought a piece of fly. I thought a piece of fly was in my mouth. We're good. <laughs> um. Oh. Oh. This is a bodysuit with like the clasp that's right at the crotch. And so there's a little bit of a interesting situation happening there. <laughs> it's going to feel good just to rip this thing off. Um, I wanted to bring up, have you ever been to a live haunted house? So they're becoming more and more popular and I keep seeing more and more videos. Maybe it's my algorithm. Maybe it's been going on for a very long time, but there are essentially pop-up mansions that pop up at Halloween time and it's a horror show. It's basically a haunted house you have to walk through 
and you have to go through the whole thing before you can escape, but it's full of actors and they're dressed up as zombies, as dolls, as witches, as you name it, whatever Halloween character you can think of, spooky, spooky ones, zombies are in these haunted houses. And it's more of like a jump scare where you go through and, but I was at one, actually the only one that I've ever been to was in Mexico at the Barcelo Resort. It had just opened. It was the creepiest, craziest thing I've ever seen. There were live actors also in that haunted place, even though it's it was like a solid location. It was not meant to be moved around. It was like going to stay there. The haunted house was part of like the whole resort experience where you could take your kids to this haunted house. And so we're there, we're going through and I just couldn't believe even the um, illusions they had, like you had to walk through this tunnel, but it's like the whole thing is a video screen of it, like spiraling and then, but at different speeds. So you'd be confused as to how fast you were even walking or if you were even walking forward or backwards. <laughs> so that was part of it. There were these vaulted ceilings, but it was all bodies like plastered to the, and then like a great big kind of dragon devil like character in the corner that was like breathing smoke and like the chest was moving up and down and and you're like you can barely even see what's going on and then there's like lightning through windows so anyway crazy and but they were full of actors so it was kind of like one of those live experiences that I had, but it was not like a pop-up one that happens in like big cities and people go and it's an event and they're chasing you down hallways. And like, I feel like I want to do it and I could do it. I'm like sort of tempted because Calgary is not super far away from me that I feel like I might do it this year. Where, how, I don't know. Uh, but I'll probably film it. <laughs> I will maybe GoPro it like chess GoPro and maybe just have like a stick GoPro. I've got a couple of them and just do it and film my reaction. Cause I, when I anticipate, I have like six cents when it comes to somebody hiding on me where I I walk into a living room and I've got a friend over and suddenly my friend is not where she's supposed to be. I freaking know she's hiding around the corner. So I start, but because I anticipate the scare, it makes it 10 times worse because I'm waiting for it to happen. So I know it's going to happen and I get 10 times, my reaction is more than if I were to just not suspect anything at all. So it's kind of a fun, one of those funny things, but, um, would you be interested in coming along on that adventure? <laughs> Come with me to a live haunted experience. And it would give me an ultimate excuse to do it just to go and film. I'm, I'm working. <laughs> I might have gone for a really nice massage and a nice dinner too, but I'm filming this one segment. <laughs> I'll just take you along the whole trip. But anyway, okay, everyone, that concludes our first episode of Halloween Kitty Liquor, episode one. Um, there's three more to go. And if you, if you have suggestions as to what you want to see, um, if you want to see... I have some fun cocktails planned, some fun costumes. That's pretty much worked out. But if you want me to talk about certain things or different categories, or if you have some really good haunted stories or crazy, like horrific stories, let me know in the comments. If you know where, like a source that I can go to to find some of these that maybe I haven't seen before, you haven't heard before from me, let me know in the comments below. And um, I'm going to link that Russian story down below too, so that you can find that. You probably won't need need it. You can just look it up and type it a few keywords <laughs> and find it because it is such a wild story. Anyway, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Also check out my OF and my Patreon. And um, yes, like this video, subscribe if you're not already subscribed and I will see you all in my next video. Bye.